across the British West Indies and the whole British Empire, the slave trade and the institution of slavery was officially abolished in 1834. This is conventionally said to mark the end of bondage, the rise of quote unquote liberalism, the origin point for an eventual freedom for all. For the four years preceding that date, a halfway house institution was erected called apprenticeship. During the apprenticeship period, enslaved people across the British Caribbean were put into a new legal category, half property, half person. They were made into debt peons, paying off half of the price of their manumission through their work. The other half would be borne by the British state, which authorized a mind-bogglingly large compensation package for the slave owners of the Caribbean in 1834. Damned as property and damned as persons, the so-called apprentices were made to compensate their enslavers for the slave owner's loss instead of the other way around. Slave owners sensing the end of their way of life, what Jean Rees in her beautiful book describes as the garden of quote unquote dead flowers and gardens gone to the bush, unquote, seemed intent to whip, compel, and coerce the last drops of life and labor out of a decaying system. But they did not confine the whip to the bounds of the Caribbean. In fact, they began to whip, compel, and coerce laborers in the workhouses of Ireland and Scotland and Southern England. But more significantly, a regime of force and coercion arose across Asia and Asia Pacific and eventually across the interior of Africa. Often through kidnapping and trickery and the use of brute force, new laborers were brought from distant lands to the plantations of the Caribbean at the coming of abolition. These workers, mostly from Asia, were called, quote unquote, coolies. They were contract laborers or sometimes debt peons. There's a difference, and I can talk about that after, working under the dread of corporal punishment. At the same time, the plantation itself mutated into new shape and began to travel the face of the earth. In, it is in this context, in British Guyana, that the following events took place in 1836. <clears throat> the plantation of Reed and Hoop, Peace and Hope, ironically enough, that's what it was called, a plantation in British Guyana, was owned by this man, John Gladstone, who lived in London. <clears throat> On that plantation, Rose, a black laborer of the plantation of Hoop, was deposed by a fact-finding committee about events that had just recently transpired there. She testified, quote, I recollect some coolies running away and going to Berbice long time ago. It was two or three months after they came. I heard they went to Berbice. We were free before they went away, meaning this was just after 1834. Adonis, a black slave foreman, and Ram Singh, an Indian sardar, or an overseer for the coolies, were sent for them. The coolies returned before Adonis and Ram Singh came back. I saw them when they were brought to the estate, but I did not see who brought them. They were carried to the sick house. Next day, they flogged all those that ran away. They brought all from the sick house together and took them to the Negro yard to be flogged. I saw them flogged. Mr. Jacobs was the only white man present. The driver for them flogged them. They were flogged one after the other. They got more than three licks, but I cannot say how many and cannot say that they got five. Their backs were not cut, but in bumps. They appeared to me as severely punished as my mateys were during the apprenticeship when flogged. They were flogged with a cat, a cat and nine tails whip, the same as was formerly in use. Some cried and some did not cry. There was no blood. When the blacks have been flogged, I have seen blood on their backs." Unquote. Notice some salient features of this first-hand account from Reed and Hoop. First, the speaker is a black slave woman speaking about the attempted escape of Indian quote-unquote coolies or indentured servants from the plantation. Second, the audience is a fact-finding com uh, committee convened in 1838 
to determine whether practices of slavery were continuing uh, even after the abolition of slavery. Third, notice that a black and an Indian observer are sent out to capture the absconders. Fourth, notice Rose's comparative analysis in which she remarks the ways that Indians are now treated like black slaves, whipped in the same Negro yards, kept in the same sick houses, flogged as severely by the same cat o nine tail whips. But she also mentions this difference. She sees no blood on their backs, which is different from what the slaves used to experience. The outcome of the investigations into these forms of punishment so reminiscent of slavery, the torture on Vreden Hoop, were the following. The general manager of the estate, the manager of the coolies, and the medical officer were all indicted and convicted of brutal assaults before the inferior criminal court of British Guyana and either fined or imprisoned. The result, however, for this man, John Gladstone, the slave owner of Reden Hoop, who lived in London, is a study in contrast. He went on to become one of the most important power brokers in London just at this time, fashioning policy for the whole British, British West Indies as well as the British East Indies and for the labor migration system that connected the two. This plantation owner, John Gladstone, remained a very important man. He stood at the center of plantation empire. Here we have, in the 1830s, an unprecedented conjuncture and entanglement of one's distant peoples and histories, bound together by commercial, military, and political ties linking Britain, the Caribbean, Africa, and India. We see emerging ideas about race, labor, economy, agriculture, and ecology. My central argument is that the labor relations, land relations, financial institutions, and agroecological relations, so characteristic of Caribbean slavery, did not die away in the 1830s with abolition, but, were rather, but rather went through a genuine mutation, which allowed them to travel like a metastasis to new parts of the earth and to implant and expand across the global south. Caribbean forms of force, control, and industrial agriculture were disembedded through abolition and traveled eastward to the Indian Ocean, Asia Pacific, and Sub-Saharan Africa. The planter class of the British Empire, and although I'm not an expert, I would surmise the French and the Dutch empires as well, that planter class found life after death in the East. The events taking place in the 1830s have important implications for the world we live in today. The unprecedented events taking place on the Vreden Hoop plantation in British Guyana, and eventually across, let me just go back here, this whole belt that um, has been called the World Plantation Belt, signaled the rise of a new global agroecological regime based on an accelerated enclosure of croplands across the global south, as well as the expansion of settler farming across North America and the white settler colonies. So, so plantation slavery ends in the 1830s in the British Empire and in other empires follow after that. This period from the 1830s onwards is often considered to be the age of the Industrial Revolution, the age of liberal uh, empire, or the age of liberalism. And what I'm interested in is, in some ways, what's happening um, on the plantations and how the plantations spread exactly at that time, exactly at the time that conventional wisdom tells us bondage was coming to an end. The period from the 1830s to 1930 saw an eruption of plantation farming, marked by the production of export-oriented agricultural commodities that fed the Industrial Revolution. The agricultural products that went into making refined sugar, soap, rubber for tires, tea, clothing to clothe the workers in 
European industrial cities, as well as the shipping bags used to package goods and commodities to be sent overseas, were produced initially on colonial plantations using forced labor of different kinds. The lands on which these plantation enclosures appeared were confiscated through militarism, taken away from sovereign groups considered to lack sovereignty uh, due to their perceived racial inferiority. These agricultural commodities were sent by railroads and then by sea to factories in Europe. Up to the 1830s, Europe's trade with Asia was primarily marked by what is called mercantile trade, by commerce and exchange of silver for commodities such as spices or porcelain or textiles. But beginning in the 1830s, we see the rise of a new, aggressive, militarized plunder and conquest of Asian lands and the destruction of native sovereignties that actually echoed that previous period of slavery uh, and what took place on the west coast of Africa and across the Americas. <clears throat> As part of this big change, what Kenneth Pomerantz calls the quote unquote great, uh, great divergence, huge populations were displaced across the Bay of Bengal, which is, where is it? Thank you. <laughs> it's right there on the end, okay. Um, uh, across the Bay of Bengal and across the South China Sea, on this side of the map, and were sent to other parts of the earth to work in industrial agriculture as, uh, at suppressed wages. A portion of this displacement was interregional, with tens of millions of Africans, Indians, Chinese, and Japanese laborers boarding, boarding ships for the Caribbean, the American West Coast, Latin America, and the shores of Asia Pacific. And I wanted to also mention that at the same time of the 1830s, if you go to what's happening here in the Atlantic, this is also, in some ways, the eruption of the slave trade. It's taking place to the American South. It's also taking place um, especially to Brazil. So that factors into the story as well. But there is even a larger number, an obscure number, of laborers who are migrating regionally or internally to work on nearby emerging plantation frontiers that were opening up across uh, Asia at the time. The Asian and Pacific waters, in addition to the Atlantic, served as a labor well for the emerging agroecological regime. Simultaneously, huge amounts of credit and finance capital were disinvested from the Caribbean and now directed to agrarian frontiers in India, Ceylon, Malaya, Vietnam, Indonesia, Hawaii, and the list goes on. Here we have a global whirlwind of, plantation, of the plantation complex, a churning storm of circulating bodies, investments, and institutions around the eye of London, Amsterdam, Paris, and other European centers of finance, credit, and joint stock companies. A century-long agroecological regime emerged around the 1830s, veiled by the, tech, uh, by the terminology of liberalism and free trade, which actually depended heavily on the expansion of coercive force, occupation, and waged bondage to all corners of the earth. The Caribbean moved to Asia just as Asia moved to the Caribbean during the decades of the plantation empire. The plantation complex invented in the Caribbean entailed a racial system of land appropriation and labor control. It entailed the enclosure of lands for the intense cultivation of single crops, a practice called monocropping, which were sent into the international market. The plantation complex involved the outlay of huge amounts of credit which served as the lever for vast infrastructural projects of agroecological transformation, including land enclosure, irrigation works, railways, and the dredging of deep sea docks. In short, the plantation complex invented in the Caribbean from about the 1600s to the end of the, uh, the, end of the 1700s mixed together racism, colonialism, finance capital, mercantile capital, militarism, and agricultural science in such a way that allowed that complex, like a metastasis, to pick up, disembed itself, and travel to new places. And I wanted to show you in a series of three uh, 
graphs or maps you know, visually how that plantation <laughs> complex actually travels. So 1710, um, this is uh, kind of the beginning of the story, if you like, where the plantation complex is mostly um, here in the Americas, uh, in North and South. Then we come to 1838, uh, which is right after the time of abolition, and you see that the new centers for the plantation are the Indian Ocean, certainly Mauritius, uh, parts of West Africa, parts of East Africa. And then finally, when it comes into its full-fledged form, by the 1920s, it's now spreading across the whole band from the uh, Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer, across what would come to be called the Third World. <clears throat> so what traveled along with this plantation complex? As the plantation complex traveled from the Caribbean Sea to the Indian Ocean and Asia Pacific, we see the transfer and adaptation, the mutation of forms of forced labor, including the chain gang. This is a chain gang that you see depicted. Um, the preference for women on the fields. This was a phenomenon of slavery, actually, that as slavery became a more mature system, there was a preference to employ women as opposed to men on fields because they were more easily exploitable thanks to both cultural forms of patriarchy as well as capital, uh, quote unquote, modern forms of patriarchy. The use of the task wage, you can ask me what that is, but it's a different kind of wage that was often used under slavery um, and during indentureship. The enduring presence of coercive overseers, there he is, on his horse, with their paraphernalia of rods and whips, and the use of physical violence as a subsidy to make labor cheaper and more pliable. We also see the transfer of horticultural and botanical methods as evidenced by these master manuals from the Caribbean that began to circulate across the new plantation frontiers of Asia by the mid-19th century. Some of the most important are, for example, Monero, Elias Monero's indigo planter. He was a planter in the 1700s in Saint-Domingue, which became Haiti. And this document, the Indio, uh, the Indio maker, indigo maker, um, be became one of the most celebrated manuals in places like Java, Ceylon, Bengal, in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Laborie is also here, who was another um, planter from, here's Laborie, coffee planter of Saint-Domingue, uh, a, a planter from the uh, Saint-Domingue before it became Haiti again. And this document became especially important, for example, in Ceylon and Malaya, where there was a lot of coffee planting. There is also Alvaro Reynoso, who was a planter in Cuba, and a specialist in sugar production. And this manual, again, um, traveled to parts of uh, Bengal, Malaya, Ceylon, Indonesia, Philippines, as sugar production was, began, was begun there. So one interesting point is that places like Jamaica and Haiti were not just uh, significant within their own empires, but they became, they were seen in some ways as the scientific Mm, experimental hotbeds or think tanks, if you like, for how um, the modern industrial plantation should work. And they had an afterlife much after the end of the slave regimes in Saint-Domingue or Jamaica in a very different part of the world. After the abolition of slavery in the 1830s, the slave system of agricultural production is not consigned to history and is also not seen as some kind of abomination or aberration. Rather, it becomes a focus of intense official fascination by, for example, British businessmen and government officials investing in the new colonial frontiers of Asia. The East India Company, for example, was smitten with what it called interest in the quote unquote West India method. And it invited a series of slave overseers from cotton plantations and sugar plantations in Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, Jamaica, and other islands of the Caribbean to South India to move to, they funded their travel to South India, Bombay, Bengal, um, in order to set up what they called model farms in the 1830s and 1840s. These overseers brought machines such as the ones depicted here, like the gin house or the vacuum pan, which were 
uh, quintessential with Caribbean plantation production, but they also brought with them their whips, their hothouses, their sick houses, their dungeons, their modes of labor control. We also have the transfer of plantation technologies from the Caribbean to India, including um, uh, technologies relating to seeds and biota, sugarcane, cotton, coffee, cocoa, tobacco, gutta percha, which was used to make telegraph lines, um, the ways of perfecting tea, indigo, jute, rubber, all of the, these botanical and biological innovations uh, involve circulations of knowledge between the termini of the Caribbean Sea and the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> right, good. So I want to spend now the last portion of my talk moving in a different direction, which is less talking about what was migrating, which we know now were the laborers, the seeds, the machines, the technologies, the conceptual languages, but I want to talk more about how things came to migrate in the first place. What I want to discuss is what are the conditions of possibility for these circulations. I want to talk about the movements of capital and of capitalists. Here, capital, which is often invoked as an ill-defined and abstract term, here I would like to define it in a more concrete way. I want to talk about this in terms of understanding how the power to coordinate the movement of value over ge geographic space developed, how the power to disembed, extract, and accumulate value over time was obtained. What were the dynamics of that power that managed to create that whirlwind that I showed you a few slides ago, that managed to coordinate that vast and unprecedented interpenetration between the two hemispheres of the global south? So that's what I'd like to move to next. And to do that, let's return to the story of John Gladstone, who we met at the beginning, and consider his social and political constellation. John Gladstone was a Scottish merchant, a businessman from the English periphery, who accumulated immense wealth and made a name for himself, quite literally you'll see, among the gentlemanly capitalists of his time. He literally bought himself into the aristocracy, uh, obtaining through purchase a baronetcy in his 60s. He was born a commoner with the last name Gladstones. He soon reinvented himself, dropping that S which smacked of commonness, and thereby made himself, in this gesture, singular. His <laughs> trades on the cotton exchanges of Liverpool went well, and he soon began investing in slaves and plantations in the Caribbean. He eventually put capital into the East India trade. Among his children were three sons of note, Robertson, William, and Thomas, one of whom went on to become the famous prime minister. By 1830, Gladstone, who had garnered vast wealth through rentierism and trade, especially thanks to his plantation investments, his investment in logistics and shipping, and his involvement in the Liverpool cotton trade, now decided it was time to enter the highest rung of politics. In 1830, now a very important man, he penned a letter to the then Home Secretary, Robert Peel, explaining that if slavery were to be ended, there would need to be some new form of cheap labor that would have to take its place. Abolition and freedom was not incompatible, he argued. In fact, freedom went along with the continued project of compulsory labor for the quote unquote lesser races. He proposed replacing slaves with indentured laborers from Africa. By the time he went to implement his plan in 1834, at the time of abolition, now with the blessing of the government, he in fact obtained his workers from indigenous tribes in India. By this time, Gladstone had expanded his plantation holdings and he had sent his son, Robertson, go back, Robertson, Robertson Gladstone. He sent his son Robertson to Demerara, or British Guyana, to oversee his new plantations. He also had a nephew, F.M. Gillanders, whom he sent to Calcutta. So here's Gillanders. And also in Calcutta at the time was another one of his nephews, Robert, Abertnot. And those two formed a company, 
uh, that did the bidding of Gladstone at a distance. In 1834, the British government compensated slave owners for the loss of their human property. I mentioned this at the very start. Based on a huge loan taken out from a banking syndicate led by the Rothschilds, the British government went into debt to the tune of 20 million pounds at that time, which today has been estimated by experts to be in today's money between 13 billion dollars and 200 billion, 13 billion pounds and 200 billion pounds, depending on how you think of that amount. And I can tell you details about how this is calculated, but it's a, it was a vast amount of money. It was equal to 40% of the gross domestic product of Britain at the time. It was a huge debt. Using that slave compensation money, Gladstone was able to enlist his family in order to transfer this capital now to the new frontiers of empire. He enlisted his nephews in Calcutta to secure a set of in Indian indigenous people, the so-called uh, hill people of Bihar, a term that the British were using. He obtained a ship. He took uh, that group of Indians first to Mauritius, where they started working on the plantation of one of Robert Arbuthnot's cousins, who was a plantation owner in Mauritius. And then from there, there was another group that went on to British Guyana, reaching British Guyana in 1834, and making possible the story that I began with, with Rose, uh, and what she observed on the plantations. So here we have the beginning of an answer to the question of how this genuine mutation of the agro-industrial order took place beginning in the time of abolition, this eruption of the plantation complex. The unprecedented eruption of finance capital into the hands of ex-slave owners gave them the power to invest into new parts of the earth. They invested into the railways of the United States and the railways of Scotland and the railways of India. British banks began investing in Central America and South America, but they also invested into the plantations of Asia. And as much as capital is an abstraction, this story shows us that it is embedded in family relations and friendships, in the relations between uncles and nephews, fathers and sons, and in the culture of the planter class that actually stretched across the whole British Empire. The life of capital is a family affair. Now, during this time, Gladstone, who was located in London, began to sit at the most important tables of uh, the British government. Uh, and he was involved in policy, in forming policy that, in, that affected both the Caribbean Basin and the Bay of Bengal together. <laughs> Gladstone, as well as his sons and close friends, were involved in formulating key elements for the 1834 New Poor Law, which affected the uh, quote-unquote paupers of England. He helped to um, define the apprenticeship system through a series of uh, select committees that were called by Parliament, which I've schematized here as well as policies for the rise of the indenture uh, system. All of this beginning in around 1834 and then kind of playing out of the next uh, decade. So we see here what I'm beginning to think of as a kind of Gladstone clique. And I, I don't really have time to go into so much detail about what these lines represent. But they represent either family bonds or friendship. In red, we have actual slave owners, people who had slaves in the Caribbean, who received compensation, and who went on to then define what apprenticeship should look like, or went on to define how trade should take place with East India, or to um, form policy for the, uh, for the establishment of the plantations across the Bay of Bengal in the 1840s. So this group remained extremely influential in what some historians call the rise of the Second British Empire, which is, which is the British Empire after the 1830s. Here, for example, is another image showing you um, a variety of directors and chairmen of the East India Company who were slave owners, who received compensation uh, in 1834, and who therefore were obviously carrying with them a lot of conceptual baggage, but also a lot of wealth from that huge uh, payout that the British government gave uh, in that time. Caribbean slave-owning capital traveled to Asia after 1834 and established a net 
of ligaments and connections that, uh, in fact, linked the Caribbean and Asia in an unprecedented way. And I came up with um, some schematizations of this. I'll try to explain what this is showing. And this is thanks to uh, help that I received from two colleagues in London, Nick Draper and Chris uh, Jessopson, as well as um, work that was done by two of the Radcliffe Fellows uh, at here. Um, and a lot of time reading the compensation report and looking through, trying to cross-reference with um, the archives of the East India Company. And what this shows, each of these dots is a person. And there are 97 dots there. Uh, there are 97 slave owners that we've traced thus far who actually uh, transferred their capital from the Caribbean to Asia um, sometime between the 1800s and uh, 1840. So there is a kind of a 40-year uh, uh, image or perspective that is being presented here um, in one graph. And I wanted to, uh, first, uh, maybe we can just look at this in terms of the gestalt of it, and you see that some of the main connections are made through the East India Company. They're also made through Bengal. You see that some of the main connections of the Caribbean are coming out of Jamaica, but also Grenada. And you also see uh, Guyana coming up very, very often. Now, to make this make a little more sense, I pulled out just a few examples from within this group of 97. And there are more, but this is the beginning of um, trying to trace in a very concrete way the extent to which uh, this uh, slave capital, this compensation capital was being transferred. I give you four examples. First, Leonard Ray, who was born in Jamaica, uh, and he owned plantations there. And he departed for Bengal in the 1840s, where he started sugar plantations in Gorakhpur. And by the late 1840s, he then moved on to Malaya, establishing coffee plantations. And he became known in Malaya as the quote unquote father of coffee. Thomas Boyce Titler, born in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. He was sent to Jamaica, this is a very interesting story, he was sent to Jamaica at the age of 15 to apprentice on a plantation just at the time when slavery was ending, just at the time when there was fear that the West Indian method was going to die away. He then went on at age 18 in 1838 to Ceylon where he went on to make a name for himself as the quote unquote father of Ceylonese coffee. And he also uh, worked, did a lot of work in developing the, um, the migrant labor system uh, in Ceylon for the government. Julie Dorothy, a planter of French origin who redirected cap her capital from uh, the slave plantations into shipping and began investing heavily in the shipment of indentured slaves to Mauritius. And Guidan Dutai, a planter, at least one planter that I found, I've been looking uh, very intently for more, but this is one example, of a planter from Saint-Domingue who then travels across uh, the imperial boundary from the French Empire to the Dutch Empire, and we meet him next in Java where he's an owner of coffee plantations there. The effect of all of these planter migrations and capital transfers was the propagation in different and new parts of the earth of uh, diverse features of this plantation complex that I outlined earlier. Global economic mutations take place because of impersonal abstract forces, yes, on one level, of course, but they also take place because of material, personal, personal and interpersonal movements at another level. In the 1830s to the 1850s, we see a proliferation of experiments by small-scale planters, the rise of a decentralized network of finance. Racial forms of domination and exploitation travel through this planter diaspora. We see the use of techniques such as whipping, boxing of ears, the using of prisons, the using of hothouses, the use of gang labor and task work, as I mentioned before. And all of this is also traveling through these family ties and friendship networks, just as much as the capital is. Now I want to conclude the story by seeing what happens to this plantation complex by the time that we reach our own days. 
From the 1870s to the 1930s, we see the consolidation of this agroecological regime under the sway now of new great multinational corporations. The rise of multinationals and the pumping in of finance capital allows for the expansion of modern industrial agriculture all the way now from uh, the Tropic of Cancer to Capricorn uh, across what will become, as I have said before, uh, known as an actor's category, the third world. Unilever, Tate and Lyle, Sunlight, Booker McConnell, Tetley T, this is like a litany now, Lip uh, Lipton's, Duncan's, Ford, Firestone, Dunlop, Michelin, I'm not done, Goodyear, United Fruit Company, Alexander and Baldwin, thanks to Tiano for that, and other such huge multinationals began to agglomerate their plantation holdings worldwide. And in many parts of the global south, these companies actually became inseparable from the state itself. British Malaya went from having not a single rubber plant to producing more than 500,000 tons of rubber per year between 1900 and 1920. Unilever cultivated 74,000 hectares of land, the size greater than New York City in oil palms between 1911 and 1918 in the Congo. The Ford Corporation tried and failed to turn 15,000 square kilometers of the Amazon into a huge rubber plantation in the 1920s, an area that they called Fordlandia. But what was happening behind the branding? We see in the sources, the way that the terms black and niggers come to be employed in company correspondences and in corporate boardrooms to talk about ethnic communities as diverse as Bengalis, Filipinos, Afro-Caribbeans, Indo-Caribbeans, and Fijians. In this parlance, black refers to a kind of laboring body on the fields, subject to bondage, requiring discipline, requiring civilization through labor. By the 1950s, Economists, I, I wanted to show you two more images here. So these are images from this kind of 1920s, 1930s period. And there's, you know, scholars talk about, uh, in some ways, the, the staging of the photograph. And here we have the blacks, and we have, you know, the white overseer or the white corporate, you, you know, he's probably a corporate um, visitor on the plantations. Here is Tail, uh, Tate and Lyle, which, was, which is still today a huge sugar producer. This is an image from their big plantation in Karani. And again, we have this you know, very quintessential kind of colonial scene. By the 1950s, economists from across the third world argued forcefully that this expansion of the plantation complex, first thanks to footloose planters and the help of the colonial states, and then, due to the machinations of multinational corporations, resulted in, quote unquote, deindustrialization and the dependence, the enduring dependence of third world nations on Western economic institutions. Now, we live in a post 1830s world, I would like to argue after this talk. The Green Revolution of the 1930s to the 1970s the period that follows what we might think of as the age of plantation empire, was marked by the rise of a US-dominated regime of genetic engineered, genetically engineered seeds, petro-fertilizing, which means the use of petroleum product derivatives to make the land um, more productive, but also poisons and, uh, um, and obviously kills um, biological life at the same time, as well as the coming of great mechanization to plantations. All of this uh, was actually integrated into the national policy directives of many new third world nations during this time of the Green Revolution, which was also the time of decolonization. But beginning in the 1980s, this Green Revolution period was superseded by the strident re-involvement of Western banks and multinational corporations in redesigning agrarian frontiers across the earth the period of new enclosures in which we still live. And that's not my term. That's a term that uh, many ecologists and um, critical economists use to talk about our present. Argentina, Brazil, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, southern parts of Africa have borne the agroecological brunt of transnational finance. Today, food security in developing nations across the world has diminished, not grown, as many produce, many of these nations produce more 
agricultural commodities for international markets than staples for their own home consumption. The ILO estimates that 500 million people today work on plantations, but this does not include the millions of undocumented children and often undocumented women uh, who are a major part of this economy. In fact, that 500 million is a gross underestimate. Undocumented trades and shadow economies and informal employment, whether in the agricultural or non-agricultural sectors, comprise more than half of all employment in the world today. It is said that likely the majority of the um, undocumented workers in the informal economy are women. In other words, more than half of the laborers that make this world economy run are hidden from our sight, unrecognized by governments, unregistered by statistics, but also easily invoked as scapegoats to explain economic turmoil. Our consumption depends on the, for as its condition of possibility on the continued and accelerated dispossession and enclosure of sovereign cultural domains. And I, just to make that point, that's what this graph is showing, that the rate of increase of enclosure has, has gone up over time, including to our own time. It hasn't gone down. It's not as if this process has come to, has abated or come to an end. <clears throat> our consumption depends as the condition of its possibility on the continued and accelerated dispossession and enclosure of sovereign cultural lands, the purchase of human labor at discounted rates by the use of bondage and force, and the large-scale destruction of the ecological web of life. But poets, artists, writers, activists, and everyday surviving people within the plantation complex and within the vast realm that some scholars call the realm of disposable life or the disposable economy, even by their everyday acts of survival, make the point that there is an inscrutable way in which life resists, regenerates, endures, reassembles. And it does so as it resists the violent pursuit of enclosure and control that masquerades as progress and has done so for centuries. And that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>